It's time for Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast from the Spacebook for the Fandom Podcast Network with me, Dan Hadley, Birmingham's king of the geeks and yours, a designated driver down the uh, A roads and B roads, literally this time, <laughs> of this glorious fantasy universe, explored and celebrated as always on our wide-ranging, non-gatekeeping gatekeeping show for all generations and regenerations, whatever decade or century you started watching, reading or listening along to the adventures of our hero, Doctor Who. So come and step into our TARDIS and share this journey together here with us on Type 40. Hello, yes, here we are. Type 40 on the road. <laughs> this is cutting edge podcasting, kind of making it up as we're going along and breaking new ground constantly because yes, uh, I've got a packed lunch waiting. There's a flask and some various uh, sandwiches, nondescript. Some of them are looking like they're a little past their best, but then again, I did make them myself. There's a few uh, scotch eggs and some of those some of those little little biscuits. I can't remember what they're called. Maybe my friend, maybe my first guest will know. We've got two guests on this particular show. And the first one, of course, it's this is all his idea. And uh, when we talk about the 80s and retro Doctor Who, is it any wonder? It's come from the mind of the original lunatic, my friend Simon Horton. Here he is. Hello, greetings, greetings. <laughs> Hi, Simon. Happy belated Easter to you. And happy belated Easter to you too. Here we are in in, in spring, our second our second spring in lockdown. But there we go. Yeah. Well, the beauty of it is, we are a little late for actual Easter, but this being a time machine, we can go back and we can enjoy Easter all over again. And it doesn't have to be Easter 2021, does it? It could be Easter, Easter 1991 or 1971 or 1983. What do you think? I think I'm going to go for 1983. Thank you very much, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you remember what, what are those little biscuits that you, that you, your my mum used to put them in a packed lunch? They're sort of short things like that. They've got a brown filling. Penguins. No, no, no. They're sort of like shortbread around the outside. They're not chocolate oh, biscuits. There's not breakaway. Biscuits. There was penguins. There was breakaway. Mm. Uh, there was blue ribbons. I know that they... Well, the thing is, they used to make you go to the toilet. And, of course, when you're on a long car journey... <laughs> not, all, you not, all, the not always the best thing to eat by the fistful when you're on a three or four hour car journey because as you remember I mean the the, uh, the various service stations back in the 80s if you were doing one of these road trips they weren't quite as nice as they are now were they? no they weren't quite as plush no no in fact they were probably fairly few and far between i can't even remember now did we even use them i don't think you ever used to because your parents would never let you stop at them because they were too expensive so you were never actually allowed to stop i think that's the truth it's the of same it. with me. <laughs> exactly the same with me mm, well maybe maybe our other guests will will know the answer to this question you can remember what these things were called but yes we couldn't make this that easy for simon although this his idea i didn't want to let him off too lightly so we have got another guest but the conceit of this is for the very first time i know who the guest is Obviously, he knows who he is, and he knows who we both are. But Simon has no idea who's going to be joining us. In it's a bit like this is your life, time. isn't it? This is it is like this is your life. It is. It is a little. So we've got to we've got to shuffle over now and make room in this kind of. It's a virtual Ford Princess, I think, that we should sort of commandeer for our journey, Escort. our journey down to Longleat here to Longleat eighty three. So if we move over, maybe there's room enough for production designer. And massive Doctor Who fan, dressed for the part, it's Phil <laughs> Newman. Well, hey! <laughs> Phil Newman, Hello. how fantastic to see you again after all these years. Yes, I know, it's been a long time, hasn't it? <laughs> it as soon as he said production designer, I knew there could only be one person. He knew it had to be you. <laughs> It's lovely go. to meet up with you again in in in, in I think the last time we met was was uh, in London. I think we we sat and had food out uh, out in London a few years back. We did in Soho. Yeah, that's right. In we Soho. did. Yeah. We I don't did. know how many lovely. years ago that was. I don't. I don't uh, want to think about how many years ago it was. <laughs> it was truly. It wasn't that many years ago. I remember it was a lovely lovely spring day. It was a sunny spring day. Yeah, it was. Might it might even have been might even have been to the day I don't know probably about I'm guessing about five years ago maybe yeah five or six years ago I think must be oh well, it's, it's, friends it's, yeah. and companions reunited for you here on Type Forty <laughs> on the road you don't get this on Radio Free Scar do you <laughs> it's fantastic I mean Phil and I we go back how many how many years do we go back Phil what, when did we first meet would it be oh, in convention I, I, convention yeah it would have been a 
panopticon or something like that i imagine i wonder whether it would it have been um would it have been uh the, the bath conventions did you i think you went to did you go to bath oh yeah it might be i think it was one of the yeah, was i did fan aid? Were they called fan aid yeah or i did go like to a that? couple in bath i think it was that in it so that we, we were going there, back there to was one evening. fan aid wasn't there wasn't that the one that paul cornell said paul cornell 84 85 wasn't it yeah absolutely 80 I, i'm i'm thinking it was the yeah and simon lydiard so so yeah we basically go back about 30 odd 35 years something ridiculous like that wow yes well <laughs> this is absolutely perfect isn't it because yes we are all going back to the 80s now virtually back to the 80s to 1983 to the year of uh, karma chameleon and and flash dance irene cara and those those leg warmers on <laughs> Simon's wincing at the memory. Did they pinch a bit? Those I never I never actually wore any of those, but it looked like it looked like a lot of fun. No, nor did I, I for, for the record, nor did I. And neither did I. In case anybody's got I, the idea. It wouldn't surprise me if you, if you could get some like your your scarf that you're wearing here on the video call. They would make great leg warmers, wouldn't they? Those colours. Well, this. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm sure you. That's what they used to be. Anyway, they used to be kind of rainbow colours and stuff. Anyway. Yeah. I've certainly put That's characters in shows set in the 80s in leg warmers like that before. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you'd have so, to, wouldn't so you? If you're in the 80s, you just have to put everybody in leg warmers. <laughs> well, more importantly well, for the sake of our everybody, conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the most important factor, of course, culturally, was that 1983 was the 20th anniversary of Doctor Who. My God, doesn't 20 seems like such a small number now, doesn't it? When you think about like, coming up to 60. But my God, that it was it was huge. And although the celebration perhaps was from an age where there wasn't the multimedia domination that there is now, where things could be sort of timed and orchestrated to go across multimedia. Obviously, social media couldn't have even been thought of. But back then, it seems like there was little coordination between arms of the BBC, like BBC One and the Radio Times. Things would sort of fall between the cracks of the pavement. And so a convention like we're about to talk about, because obviously Longleat, we're talking about the Longleat 1983 20th anniversary event and this is I think many people describe it as the Woodstock of Doctor Who I wasn't there I was kind of a little bit too young I was alive but I was too young to attend our two guests today they were they were both there and the thing is this was your idea wasn't it Simon you came to me with this that you'd really like to talk about this as it was coming up to the yeah. anniversary yeah 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 um, I, I've wanted to talk about this for a while really and um and yeah it just suddenly occurred to me that the weekend that's the, the the easter weekend again which i think it, uh, if i recall correctly it was the easter weekend that that particular year um, yeah it was the sunday and the monday it was the sunday and the monday correct. the third and fourth that's right that's yeah. right and so as soon as i just realized that that we'd just gone through it again i, I just had all the memories just come flooding back so yeah well on the we, same yeah, yeah. day that you sent me that personal message i was on twitter and i saw phil he was tweeting out lots of fantastic pictures and memories and saying, oh, I remember this. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. All this kind of thing. And I'm thinking, well, who should we bring on as the third voice? I thought, this is, this is <laughs> destiny. And, <laughs> and Phil and I had spoken a little bit yeah, last year. had a great year. response as well. You, I, I was hmm. amazed. How, yeah. is, it, well, is it true, Phil, that everybody claims that they were there? Um, well, I don't know about everybody. I don't know. But, you know, um, <laughs> everybody wants it was, to claim I think, that they were uh, there. Yeah, yeah. And it was because, I mean, I don't think it wasn't difficult to get tickets. I mean, I saw the thing advertised at the end of, of an episode of Doctor Who because I had a caption come up um, that they were doing a celebration. And you just wrote off and and they sent you the details and you sent off your, your postal order or whatever it was. It probably was a postal order back then. Um, and you got your tickets and camping pass and everything <laughs> that was one of the mad fools who you know because I, I i couldn't really afford i was only working in a supermarket back then um you know i don't think i could have afforded b and b or hotels and i think they all went really quickly anyway um so i ended up buying a cheap tent and and literally camping out there over the weekend <laughs> which um i've never done 
ever since, <laughs> I have to say. We got rid of the tent <laughs> really soon after. Because <laughs> it was uh, not a very pleasant uh, experience. I, I was only, I was, only um, I was 14 at the time that I was there. Um, and so uh, we went as a family. My, my parents had got a caravan. Um, and so we went down in a caravan mm -hmm. and, we, and, and we pitched up the caravan uh, literally on the, on, on the it, it, for people that know Longleat, it's just on the other side of the, of the sort of lake facing the, facing the house, facing the mansion house. So we stayed there for the weekend. So I was lucky to be there from the Friday right the way through to the, the Tuesday morning. So, so I can, I can even remember oh, watching wow. them. I remember seeing on the, on the Saturday, I remember watching them setting up. Um, the marquees and putting in all the barriers and and, and bringing in the the the, the, the Blackpool di um, illuminated displays and that. So so I saw them literally yeah. putting it all together. I, it was it was phenomenal. I feel like gentlemen. I feel like I'm there already. This is going to be fantastic. But before we <laughs> before we continue with our mission back to Longleat in '83, I've just got to remind you guys that uh, each and every edition of our show, past, present, and future, is out there. If you know where to look to do some time traveling of your own, there'll be more about that a little later on, as well as a visit to the Matrix of All Knowledge. To us, that's the Fandom Podcast Network. Of course, to hear about all the other wonderful shows over there all those other brilliant genre podcasts with hosted by our friends yeah so i suppose the first thing that we that we should start with really when we talk about the longleat event is to sort of embed it really in the, the general picture of doctor who fandom at the time there were two doctor who exhibition locations were, that were open for several months of the year Every year, weren't there? There was one famously in Blackpool, which we've spoken about at length on top Type 40 before, but there was also the Longleat destination too, wasn't there? As you say, at the, the house. It's the the home, the ancestral home of the Mar Marquis of Bath, Simon? Yeah, absolutely, That's the Marquis right. of Bath. And, and and he was there, he was at the event. He was he was kind of the, uh, the MC, or he certainly opened and closed the event and didn't really seem to know what on earth Doctor Who was, but he loved it anyway. He was an eccentric, I believe, Phil. Did you ever get to meet him? Um, no, saw him, but uh, no, didn't didn't get to to meet him. I don't think. I mean, when we were there, we weren't really interested in Lord Bath. <laughs> we were interested <laughs> in you know in all those guests, as you can see in that picture, you know, and also the speculation that I remember on the Sunday was, will Tom Baker be here on the? Yeah, will will Tom Baker be? here on, on the Monday um, and then rumours started spreading that he'd arrived because he came for the, they, they all had a party uh, I think in the library or something um, on the Sunday night for the guests and Tom was there so that, that soon started spreading round the following morning Yeah, because I was because there as well, you know, because like I said I turned up on I think there's a bit of a sound delay. <laughs> there is a bit. Just just a little. It'll be fine. Yeah. yeah well, the um, thing is, at, at the time, these these two uh, exhibitions, they'd been it, both in place for several years, hadn't they? And Doctor Who celebrities being there, usually at the start of the season, that was quite a common thing, wasn't it, guys? And people would you know, turn up, children would turn up by the dozens, wouldn't they, to, to go and meet their heroes and I get an autograph. I don't, th I don't think well, guests what... turned up very often. I mean, I think... Um, I don't remember because I used to go. I didn't go every year during the seventies to Longleat, which was I was in Bournemouth at the time. So there, I, I never got to Blackpool until nineteen eighty five, the, the the last season, um, when I went up on my own for a few days. But Longleat was where I went. We'd go on a I'd go on a coach trip. You know, they'd be like day out coach trips, National Express day outs, you know, during the summer, and go once, probably no more than twice a year until. 82 which was when i joined the dwas and started to get in met other doctor who fans and sort of got involved in fandom sort of you know in fan activities um and then i started to go more than once a year because we go as a group um but the the first event i remember going to where there was a personality there was 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 82 i think august 82 and peter davison made i think one of his first appearances <laughs> Um, in public there um, and JNT was there and Lovett Bickford actually the director of the Leisure Hive was there as well was Not that a long a, week a guest, but because I think 
No, that was Longleat. Yeah, Longleat. Um, I've got some photos somewhere if I can find them. Um, but yeah, tw- I think it was the 29th of August. I don't know why that's in my head, but <laughs> 1982. So, um, and he was in, Peter was in costume. Um, and yeah, JMT was there. And you just, you know, the queues were enormous and you just threaded your way through the through the exhibition and he was signing in the console room. Um I think I, I think possibly, for free, of course. Mm, I think I think possibly. I mean, certainly that the, the, there used to be there used to be guests would often turn up for the Blackpool exhibition more so. They would right. Blackpool exhibition would always get for the grand opening, opening of a season. Yeah, yeah, for the grand opening, uh, and generally they tended to get a doctor there to reopen Blackpool. Uh, Blackpool, yeah. Longley tended right. not to have that quite as often, but I'm the same as Phil. I definitely yeah. I only went to Blackpool two, maybe three times at most, whereas Longleat was our one of our family holiday destinations every year from probably around about 1978 onwards. Um, oh, I great. discovered that the Doctor Who exhibition was there uh, and because we got a caravan. So every year then from about 77, 78, I would go to Blackpool. So I can certainly still remember, same as Phil, I first found out about the celebration after um probably Morden and Dead or something like that. I can't think which which episode it would have been. The, the, the 20th season was was airing at the time. Um, and so I can still remember the caption card coming up immediately after one of the episodes with this announcement yeah. about the celebration. And literally it was like all my Christmases had come at once, uh, not only because it was Doctor Who, but because it was bl- at Longleat as well, where we always used to go. Um, and, and, and so it was just... So I don't think... For me personally, I don't think there was ever any question whatsoever as to whether or not I was going to go to this. I, that was it. I, I immediately that week, I remember getting my parents to send off the check or whatever it was to book me tickets for, for the two days. Um, and it was never in any any doubt at all that, that we'd be going. Something, I think something like, like this, like this event uh, over a two day period was unheard of in this country geared around a tv show and the idea i mean i remember seeing a form or some sort of advert in doctor who monthly as it was at the time with the with the words i didn't really understand what i was reading or what was being offered i think had i i think it would have blown my mind i was just too young to sort of take it all in i was at that place where i thought i I was at that place where i i believed that i was the only doctor who fan in the world i think we've all been through that phase and so to hear about, yeah. I didn't really know what a convention was. I don't think I could conceive of it, Phil. But behind the scenes, of course, working working on Doctor Who, well, not so much behind the scenes, but but at the BBC, working on Doctor Who and acting as a sort of ringmaster was, of course, John Nathan Turner. He'd been in the role for about two or three years at this point, hadn't he? He had, he had mastered the whole publicity circuit, hadn't he? Maybe inspired by what had built up around Star Trek in, in the States and then globally. I'm not sure, but I think if, if I was JT at the time, and knowing what I know about him now, you would you would look at the, the date that was looming up in 83. If the fact you got these two destinations, staging something like that at Blackpool, knowing Blackpool, the, the surrounding area, it would have been just impossible. But something like Longleat with all those grounds, all that scope, and the... Uh, how can I put this? The sense, the sensitive ear of the Marquis of Bath, who was always very proud, apparently, to have Doctor Who as an installation at, at Longleat House. Oh yeah, all those stars aligned. So I was wondering, you know, we saw these these various ads and coupons pop up that you could fill in and and, and uh, claim your ticket for this event. Do you know, Phil? How how long in advance did J and T begin planning this? Um, I imagine it was probably the year before. Um, I imagine so. I mean, he was well aware. I remember, I mean, my first convention was Panopticon 5 in in 82, in July 82. And I remember John Pertwee, I think it was there, being asked a question on a panel saying, you know, or, you know, would you come back for a 20th anniversary, you know, thing? And of course, he let the cat out of the bag and said, well, we are, we're doing something. (laughs) <laughs> didn't say what because i don't I think it had even that. been written at that point but um but i think and jo- and john was always you know very keen on 
pub, you know, he was just a master master publicity publicity machine, really. Um, you know, he knew how to publicize because nobody else was going to do it. <laughs> at the end of the day, the BBC wouldn't know how to publicize anything, certainly not back then. Um, uh, but he knew that there was, you know, that there were opportunities there. Um, I mean, he opened up opportunities in the States as well, you know. Um, I, I, I think I but, agree. Uh, with that. I, I think we were very lucky, at, as we've talked about before now. JNT gets yeah. not a lot, but he was the, absolutely the right person to be in charge of the show for the 20th anniversary, because if anybody was going to uh, make sure it was handled properly, you're right, Phil, it was, it was JNT. He did, for all his faults, he knew absolutely what he was doing with that kind of stuff. Um, and he knew how to capitalise on it and he yeah. knew how to do it properly. And, and, and as I say, we, we, we've got to thank him for that. He was the right person at the right time. Yeah. He was an enthusiast was at the end of the day. I mean, yeah. whatever dis, well, well, you know, whatever decisions, you know, whether you, whether you, you know, agree or disagree with, you know, the, yeah. some of the creative decisions he made with the show, he always did them with the show's interests at heart. Yeah. Because he was he was the producer and he loved the show. Yes. You know, it wasn't just a job for him; it was he loved the show, um, and so you know that that was always. A, at the forefront really was making sure all the publicity stunts you know and for pictures in the papers every time there was a guest star you know people criticized some of the casting but it made headlines it got people to watch and it's funny because yeah, i can know. still remember um, on, the, on, on, on the at the actual event i can still remember as i'm sure you can phil i remember jnt walking around the event and of course we all knew by that point who jnt was from things like yeah. Doctor Who Weekly, Doctor Who Magazine. Um, we knew who Jane did. And I can still remember him walking around in his red satin jacket uh, with his dark shades well, on. That's right, uh, yeah. And, he, and he'd got Doctor <laughs> Who emblazoned on the back of this jacket. So, Puffing away at a cigarette. Absolutely. <laughs> the cigarette permanently there. And and to yeah. say this this is this isn't meant with any disrespect for Jane T at all, but he definitely you got the feeling that he was absolutely in charge there. He was wandering around the entire event, the whole weekend, happily signing autographs, chatting to people, but he walked around with authority. You knew this was his little world. This was it at this point in time. He was in he was the man. Um and, and, he and was the sweet that. spot, wasn't he? He 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 occupied this space. He was this sweet spot between the old style movie mogul. I think we I think we described yes. him as a bit of a mogul when we had Chris Chapman on the on the show last year to talk about the showman. So it was it was half movie mogul, but the other half of him was sort of a Cameron Mackintosh kind of figure, one of these impresarios that work in the West yes. End, and it, it just seemed yeah. to know instinctively what the audience what the audience wanted, what we were about, why well, the public watched Doctor Who. Yeah, and also, as I say, the and thing is, as he was walking around the, the, the Longleat celebration, and he was there the entire time, you, you literally saw him so often, you, 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 and yet there was no arrogance in him. He wasn't walking around arrogantly, although he was walking around oozing confidence and oozing, this is my baby, this is my show, yeah. uh, welcome to my world. It wasn't done in an arrogant, uh, self-centred, egotistical way at all, no. I didn't think. It was done in a loving way. No, not at all. And I think he was, he was quite concerned he was at work as well. Well I, well, I think, well, I'm not sure he was getting paid. I mean, he was being just, he was doing extra activities, really. You know, nobody was asking him to do those things. Um, he was volunteering because he was making sure that they were done the way that he thought they should be done. Absolutely. But I do kind of think he was quite concerned about the crowds. Yes. I think that's why he ended. I think, I think, I don't know whether it was Peter or Peter Davison or he, but I think he was probably the one behind getting Peter Davison to go down the crowds, you know, the queues of traffic and people wait, trying to get in during the day just to try and keep them a bit sweeter, you know. Because that's the fact, um, that's the thing that people say about the event, isn't it? They were expecting X amount of people. Simon, you probably know the numbers of people that yeah, they're expecting. Uh, they were expecting X amount amount but they got x x x x x amount yeah they were expecting i think around about 10 or twelve thousand at most and i think they got about twenty five thousand or something ridiculous like that it was a it was a phenomenal amount a phenomenal amount of people um now i, I mean i can certainly remember on the the first day on the on the sunday that was definitely the worst day for queues um 
through nobody's fault other than just purely the number of people there trying to get in. Um, I, I was lucky. I think the thing is, uh, if you were if you're a ticket holder, as I was, and obviously Phil was as well, you, you just got in immediately without any problem. I remember a little bit of um, you know, a little bit of kerfuffle, but nothing. There was no major queue or anything to get in. It was for the people who were arriving speculatively, just turning up, hoping to just buy a ticket on the door because what you've got to remember is nobody was told at that point that you couldn't just turn up and get a ticket on the door you could they were welcoming them they, they were they were quite happy for people just to turn up it wasn't like a convention now where you've got to pre-booked no you could literally turn up on the door and get a ticket but well, you I couldn't didn't realize because that you told me yeah but the, but the problem is you couldn't because as, as phil says so many people turn up, so many let's you know we've got to we've got to remember this this is important to remember this is doctor who with literally thousands and thousands, they gridlocked the roads in the whole area surrounding Longleat trying to get to this event. We think of Doctor Who as, as, as having its kind of golden era, we say the David Tennant years, when it was the most popularist and popular amongst the public. But it was just as popular back then. And people couldn't get in to the extent where eventually they were going on the radio, on Radio 2, saying, please, do not try to go to the celebration at Longleat. You can't get there. It's it's wow. gridlock. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ed Stewart was broadcasting live, wasn't Absolutely. he? He was broadcasting live over the weekend. I've got a tape recording of it somewhere. Absolutely. Um, he was Ed Stewart. Ed Stewart was up in a little um a little a, gla a little glass booth um who, broadcasting. Who was it? Remind us, Simon. Who was for the people out there who don't know? Who was Ed Stewart? Ed Stewart was one of the. Well, he's one of my heroes. Ed Stewart. He was he was one of the Radio Two DJs, and he used to do Junior Choice on on uh, on Radio Two every Saturday morning for kids. Um, and he was an absolute broadcasting legend. Sadly, died a couple of years or about five years ago now. Um, yeah. And it, but he was still doing his junior choice on Christmas Day every every year up until the year that he died. Um, and so he yeah. was there broadcasting on Radio 2 because he got a Radio 2 show. So the BBC broadcast live and it's out there on YouTube. You can you can go and find oh, this really? broadcast. Well, well, from well, see, for, for the video edition of this show, we'll put this out in the, in the description and in the show notes. If we can track down some of the video footage for that and some of this radio content that's out there on YouTube, we'll try and get the links for you so you can go and, and hear for yourself and sort of sort of imagine yourself back there at Longleat. So he would have had he would have had his booth set up. Yeah. The entire time. And he would just be playing his usual show, but yeah. he would get this uh, on and maybe well, some of the well, audience. No, he was wandering around as well. He was wandering around with a microphone too. And, and a sound and a sound record this guy because he was going around wandering around interviewing people in the various different areas like the the um the set tent and and that kind of thing and interviewing some of the guests. So, yeah. you know, I, I remember him going, I remember him walking around with a big, you know, fluffy mic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's one of those things, it's because, because, Ed, because Ed Stewart was there, mm -hmm. and the people that don't know, uh, 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 we just talked about Ed Stewart, but he was huge at the time. He was huge. Think of kind of, I don't know, Chris Evans or, or, or somebody of that kind of ilk. He, he, he was, was a presenter on Cracker Jack as well. Yeah, absolutely. He was a presenter on Cracker Jack as well. So he was, kids knew Ed Stewart. He was huge. And so for him to be there as well, it really gave the whole event this real feel of legitimacy and and celebration. You know, th th this was a much buzz, bigger. A real buzz. It was, it, yeah, a real buzz. It was the first convention I'd been to. Unlike Phil, I hadn't been to any. I didn't even know Doc 2 conventions existed. Going to Longleat was when I first found out about the Doc 2 Appreciation Society. Again, I didn't know that existed. And I certainly <laughs> thought I was the only fan in the world at that point. Um, so it was my very first convention. And it was only going to conventions afterwards, I realised that they were quite um, Doc 2 Appreciation Society style conventions at that point were really quite staid and quite stuffy and quite, you know, quite serious in comparison at that point. Whereas the celebration at Longley, it was literally, it was a party. I, I, I can't, <laughs> you, you can't get across how much. This was just an absolute explosion of excitement and fun. I'm right, aren't I, Phil? It was brilliant atmosphere. It was, um, it was, but I mean, just it was just very different. I think being outdoors um, and cold, it was quite cold. It was I cold. Remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was cold. In um, Great at least Britain, it wasn't raining. In the middle of Easter, you must be joking. At least it, and, but it wasn't say, raining, uh, which <laughs> it was on the Saturday night when I arrived to pitch up my tent. 
it was <laughs> I've, and i've never like i said it, it was awful and a friend of mine i think we came up together he he had a, a room in a b&b but he came and helped me set up this my tent and it was like a quagmire i mean it was awful it was sheeting <laughs> well, it down with rain the mud it was it was disgusting it was horrible <laughs> and there were very few facilities is, on site this, um thing, you know of course. And this is the other thing, of course, we've got to remember the aftermath of this. I mean, I know we're jumping ahead of ourselves a bit here, but, you know, talking of quagmires, the aftermath of, of the Longleat celebration, you could see by the Sunday, you could you could you could see that by the Monday afternoon, all of the yeah. ground was just literally it all turned into a quagmire. And apparently it took them a couple of years to get the grass at Longleat. That's how <laughs> it was. Because what you've got to remember... It, the, the site, the site that covered a huge area. This wasn't just like, again, like, like you might hold a convention in one hall. It was across the entire area of, of Longleat. There were there were marquees all over the place. Um, and so there were thousands of people just stamping over the grass, the, the grass where there's normally a little sign saying, please don't walk on the grass. Forget that. It was just it was a, it was a mud bath by the end of it. And as you described, in between going to see the, the standard things that we expect at a convention now, so there'd be various panels in various enclosed areas, wouldn't there? And there would yep. be, understandably, big queues to go and see our heroes. And I, I understand that some of the guests, in particular Tom Baker, there was a sort of will he, won't he about it all. But generally it was accepted that, for example, the, the doctor at the time, Peter Davison, would be there. But Peter... He was that overwhelmed by the by the huge crowds, obviously those numbers that we were talking about, that he did, as Phil described, he ventured out, didn't he, into out into the public to, uh, I suppose, to just make sure that they they stayed in line and, and kept waiting and, and to reassure them that they were going to see what they travelled in some cases all that distance, probably a couple of hundred of mi hundred miles to see them all and and to be part of this but, experience. They were there, but of course, what you've got to remember, I'm not sure. I'm not sure didn't get to see it. So a lot of people didn't get in. They did travel all that no. distance. And they simply didn't get through the doors. They got as far as we're looking here, which is basically the queue queuing up to the front doors. And this was as close as they got. Um, and in the end, not only yeah. did, did, did Peter Davison go out and walk along crowds, exactly as you see here, but also they took, as Phil mentioned, they took Bessie out and John Pertwee again drove up and down the lines just basically trying to to, to give these people who'd, who'd come from miles around a a show. just to give them something but the fact that they were basically going to be turned away and told you you couldn't get in yeah yeah so, so yeah, Phil how much did you how much did you know you know so you've booked your you've booked your tickets you're down at the event but how much did you know in advance there was the whole question of Tom Baker and everything but did you know? Well, no, was, but that was wasn't before. That the... was only that. Yeah, that was only when we were there. I don't think they announced guests. No, we because there wasn't no. there there wasn't any any you know there wasn't social media to be able to do that. Literally, no. it was just guests and and tent you know and they they just so they you know did costume displays, set displays. You know, there was the actual. The, 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 I mean, the standard exhibition was the there. Special effects team were there, weren't Arrangement they? of special effects, radiophonic workshop. But it was just, this is a celebration event, buy a ticket. There was no, you know, oh, well, John Perch will be there on one day and, you know, so we didn't know. Um, as as so far as was, I recall, it, the, the earliest I knew anything at all was when I picked up the programme. I got the, I, I got the programme. Yeah, I've got that somewhere, yeah. yeah. I, I actually managed, somehow, I managed to pick this up literally the day before. So I bought, I managed to buy this on the Saturday. I'm guessing it was because I was, as I recall, because like, I was hanging around the entire you day. You were there, yeah. Yeah, I was watching them literally setting up. And I was talking to them. I remember, you know, as a, as a snotty 14-year-old, I just going up to them and asking them stuff. So, so I... I, I I think I must have just managed to, to nab one of these. Um, and so I can remember on the Saturday going back to my parents' caravan and sitting, reading it. And, and so the earliest you got a, any idea of anything was going on was when you managed to get this and you got the programme of events. And that yeah. was basic. That, that was the earliest you knew. So I knew the day before. I was planning, literally the day before, I was planning what I was <laughs> going to be, what I was going to be doing, planning my, planning my day out um, from the program. But that was the earliest you knew anything at all. And for most yeah. people that were just arriving on the morning, you'd walk through the door, buy one of these, and then you'd start looking, okay, what are we going to do? 
Um, so it was quite um, it was quite a quite a sort of frenetic weekend uh, of of because there was so much going on. I mean, as you can see from that, that's just the one day. That's the second day there. There was a lot going on. You had a lot to choose from. As yeah, there was a video tent. I mean, and at that time, of course, there were no vid B BBC videos or anything. In fact, they took a poll in the merchandise tent, you know, as to what should be the first Doctor Who video. Um, and I think Tomb of the Cybermen came up top. But of course, that didn't exist at the time. So they That's went right. for Revenge of the Cybermen instead. <laughs> because <laughs> Which it was, was almost only... as good, but not quite. <laughs> yeah, not quite as good, no. <laughs> Um, so I understand. But, uh, I understand that although although they weren't marketing, it wasn't a slick marketing thing the way that we get now. Things, items, of merchandise were launched at this event as well, weren't they, Simon? And I believe you've got yeah, some to yeah, hand out. Literally, these behind me now, these I can remember being launched at the event by Andrew Skilleter. Um, I remember seeing the. I don't. I'm. I'm fairly confident they hadn't even been advertised in the in the magazine or anything like that. I just remember there was a massive merchandise tent. Now, again, you know, for a 14 year old who, who at that point, the closest I'd got to any Doctor Who merchandise was buying a, a Target book in Smith's or John Menzies, or maybe going to the tiny little booth in the in the Longleat exhibition. So to go into a marquee and it is full wall to wall of Doctor Who merchandise, Again, it was like all your Christmases had come at once. So I remember buying these from the exhibition. The other thing I remember, I don't know whether you remember being launched, was this, Phil. Do you remember? That was launched this particular weekend. This is the first edition that I bought from Longleat. And there it is. Right. The, the target book of Time there Flight, is. which, had, which sure. had been on the year before. Published I can remember. Yeah. Uh, well, I can remember this because there was a target. There was a target stand there, obviously, um, a W. H. Allen stand, and so there, and these were the, the. This was the brand new book, and I remember the word was going around that the, the celebration. You, they've got time flight in. They've got the new novel in, and of course, it flew <laughs> off the tables in in a matter of minutes. They were just literally. It was a feeding frenzy around the W. H. Allen <laughs> table to pick things up. Um, and the the poster prints that you've got behind you, they, they're the work of Andrew Skilleter, aren't they? Who at that point he'd also been connected with Target, hadn't he? Been an, an artist on those book covers yeah. for again for three, maybe four years. Yeah, seventy nine, eighty. Like yeah. Some of, some of our, our favourite ever covers, and he turned he turned his hand to a. Uh, I suppose he went into business in effect, didn't he? Create a. Uh, and he created his own Who Who publishing. Yeah, he this created Who Dares Publishing. Yeah. That's right. And, and That's were those right. the first items of merchandise that came out under Who Dares, Simon? Absolutely. Yes. This, this was it. Nice, and, nice. and again, I can just remember the excitement of, again, you, it's difficult now in today's context to put your head into that headspace where we had nothing. You know, a Target novel was as exciting as it got. So to go in and see stuff like this that you'd never, you didn't even know existed. It, again, people were just snapping these up like they were, there was no tomorrow. Again, they sold Gorgeous A3, A3 poster prints, but they were completely original artwork, weren't they? That, that Andrew, he hadn't taken his book covers, for example, and just turned those into posters. They were specially painted. No, he did that later. Painted, he did that later, yeah. Yeah. So it's a whole so, new so, line of merchandise that so, came so out. The thing is, so, what so, I'm so, interested so, in, though, is... What I'm interested in, though, is that the JNT and everybody else there that was that was um, sort of seizing the day or seizing the two days. JNT was doing this, although there was no multimedia conglomeration to sort of rely on to get word out and to feed it. He did have the Dwas, he did have Doctor Who monthly as it was then, and he did have enterprising people who also had a connection with the audience, like Andrew Skeleton. Well, yeah. it wasn't just him. I mean, it wasn't all down to him. I mean, they had licenses to do this kind of thing from BBC Enterprises. I think Lorne Martin, who, you know, who, who was managing the BBC exhibitions at the time, would have been um, a, a big player in this. And I think Julie Jones okay. as well. Um, you know, so it, it wasn't just JNT doing this on his own because he, he was the producer of the show, first and foremost. Um, but he was he was. All but, uh, the he was a key player, a key consultant with with what was going on. So, Lorne Martin, well, think, who I was Lorne Martin exactly, Phil? Lorne Martin was um, was the exhibition. Um, I can't remember what his actual title was, but he was um, responsible for managing BBC Enterprises exhibitions, not just Doctor Who, because they'd done other ones. I think the reason that they 
that they got the Doctor Who one at Longleat originally in the 70s was because they'd done very successful costume displays of Henry, of costumes from Henry the, um, Six Wives of Henry VIII and Elizabeth R in the house. And so oh, BBC Enterprises had, had a link. That was in the early 70s. Um, and then when they decided... I think they had um, a, at the same site, and then it was expanded, they had a lunar module, uh, a mock-up of a moon, lunar module and stuff on display there. And so they thought Doctor Who would be a good fit alongside that. Um, and then the Doctor Who took over. Um, and that's why, and that's why ultimately, you know, Longleat was, was, was such a logical place for this celebration to yeah. take place. But, but, but this is why, I, I know I keep saying this, but it, it really is a case of trying to get into the headspace of in those days, we had very little. Um, and so to go into this, this celebration, and celebration is by far the best word for it. This was far more than just a convention. Um, and, and it really did have a buzz of originality about it, a real freneticism. Um, and, and like you say, Dan, nothing had been done like this before. This didn't, this was not like Dwarf's Convention. No. Or, or ever again. I mean, that was the You're point. Right, it, <laughs> or ever, because, because it ended up being such, in a way, it ended up being a nightmare, yes. obviously, for, B, for the BBC, <laughs> because there was an awful lot of people who were disgruntled. It was all right for us. We were inside. You yeah. know, we didn't really get a sense of what was going on outside, really, until after. Um, you know, we weren't affected by by what was going on outside. And you, that's right. <laughs> and you felt and you felt really sorry. They drafted in a load of um, of, of, of military personnel to, to and put and put them in the uh, put them in um, unit jumpers and unit and unit caps. And they were the stewards. To that's try right. and but they were just they were just the <laughs> yeah. oh, they were the stewards, they? Weren't they? They? they were basically the stewards. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, they were they were just trying to do can, their job. And try we to can see them awesome. there. Yeah, because because you know again you've got to you got to remember that they the BBC simply didn't expect these many people to turn up, so they simply were drowning under people trying to keep everybody happy, um, and that was a really difficult thing to do. And so so many people, I think, quite unfairly say that Longley eighty three is just remembered for the for the queues. Well, for me as a fourteen year old, no, it wasn't. I do remember Phil's quite right that that, that yeah there was. Um, there was the video tent there, and, and this is again is the time when no videos were available at all. Um, you were very lucky if you got an occasional repeat. And so, you know, looking down, there was the Dalek invasion of Earth, the Dominators, Terror of the Zygons. I can remember because I saw. I I remember on the sun, certainly on the Monday morning, rushing. That was the first thing I went to was the tent to watch Terror of the Autons. And me too. Uh, <laughs> that was me. Uh, Terror of the Autons because. I, I remember being terrified by that as a kid. Um, but did you get in, Phil? Did you and, manage to get in? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because I was one of the first in, because right. I was camping on site. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was always amongst the first sort of dozen in in the morning on both days. And I was the same, um, yeah. But I but I, I, I didn't, I think I saw a bit of, I think I saw the first episode of Dalek Invasion of Earth on, on the previous day. And I'd looked in the, the you know the door of the tent on on you know, on a few occasions on some of the others. They hadn't expected this amount of people, and I, th um, you know, I think like I think Trouton was just. A, the I think I think I think everyone else. They may have been rather intimidated, especially outside, because as soon as they went outside of a tent, even though they had some of the military stewards around them, people just zoomed in on them, you know, and they were surrounded wherever they went. Um, escorting between wherever the hospitality was, the green room, and uh, and where they were supposed to be, you know, whether it's on a panel or doing autographs in the in the orangery or whatever, you know. Um, but Troughton, I think, was just generally quite shy at that point. That was like the first thing he'd done. Yeah. Um, but I do remember. I remember asking him a question. <laughs> in the, in the, in in the, the, in the. You remember the question? Yeah, I did because. He not long, not long before, because they publicised it. Peter Davison and Patrick Troughton appeared on Breakfast Time with Selena Scott and Bra and Frank Boff. Um, That's right. A short, a, not that long beforehand to publicise it, and Canine was there and a Dalek, um, and and Patrick Troughton had inadvertently given away the fact that the Daleks would be in the Five Doctors. As it turned out, one Dalek, but 
Um, we knew nothing about the five doctors at that point, remember. Um, but I think, uh, they, I think they were talking about the Daleks and Peter Davison said, um, well, I've yet to meet the Daleks. Um, and Troughton said something like, oh, oh, yes, we have. Oh, oh, no, we haven't. Or something like that. Anyway, it was a little slip of the tongue. Um, and so I but just asked because JNT was on the panel with, um, with Pat. Uh, he was kind of like helping him along. Um, and I remember just saying, you know, did he get any flack from the producer for revealing that the Daleks would be in the 20th anniversary special <laughs> on breakfast time? And uh, and I remember, I, I think J and T smiled, and Pat sort of said, "I don't think I did, did I? I don't think I did." And then J and T went, mm, "Yes, you did." Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, I mean, certainly, uh, as, as Phil says, this was this was Patrick Trout's first convention appearance, and and, and yeah. he was notoriously a shy man, and he didn't like talking about his craft. He didn't like talking about stuff to do with acting yeah and i don't think he remembered all that much either anyway you know it was like three intense years of of that's hard right. hard graft that's and so right. i think pretty much the memories kind of blended into one another much like tom really you know you, when you're in it you're in it and you don't really remember it's the guest it's the guest artist quite often who would have stronger memories of stories specifically because they just came in and did one thing that's right. Um, you know, or a few things across the years. I, um, that's right. And I, I mean, I certainly remember seeing the Tom Baker panel. I don't know whether you saw the, the, the Tom Baker panel. Yes, I was there for that. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. yeah. And, and, and I mean, again, that was, for me, bearing in mind, Tom Baker was my absolute hero. Um, again, that was quite sobering to be there. Firstly, obviously, it was just the most thrilling thing in the world to be in the same breathing space as Tom Baker. Um, but again, he was, Tom uh was he was he was um reserved i think is 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 the fairest thing to say with regards to that i remember somebody asking him whether he regretted not being in the five doctors and he gave a quite a prickly response mm. of, you know there's a lot of things in life i regret um uh, so, so because this, <laughs> and this and it's fair we just got to say to people out there who may not be aware this was around eight or nine months before the five doctors would air yeah it? so but we the hadn't seen yes yet. we we knew the five doctors was happening certainly and and don't forget as well in the in the in one of the marquees where they got all the sets there were two uh sets from the five doctors which was enormously oh, were i didn't know that yet. Yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah 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 they had go on phil no um yeah they had the gallifreyan uh meeting room or whatever it was room. called the, the conference, conference room they had Rattalon's, you know dark room or whatever it oh, was yeah, oh, and yeah, the control um room. Rassalon's the control, control the con Rassalon's control room was there um and and, and the unit I something else was there the as well office, the oh, unit that's right and then the unit unit headquarters was there that's right yeah and, and oh. because we didn't know we, we nobody knew what these sets were it said that what it said that they were from the five yeah. doctors but we hadn't that, that you couldn't connect them to anything so to no we didn't know the context we no, didn't know no why context. they were there and what they were there <laughs> and, and also they weren't very well lit they were literally no. in a marquee yeah you know with in ordinary so actually it's very hard to find some really decent photographs yeah. of them because they were so dark yeah. <laughs> and, and, and also i didn't even know they were there yeah, they, and yeah. they've got the full they've got the full TARDIS control room there as well with the Davison, you know, the proper Fifth Doctor um, control with panel with Chameleon, with Chameleon, Chameleon standing in the corner. Um, yeah, you just, <laughs> you, just walked, you just filed past these and you and you saw them. You, you saw all these sets, and and again, that's it's all you phenomenal. could do is file past because the queues were so long. You you yeah. could <laughs> only really sneak snake your way through. You couldn't linger. No, no, no. You know, there were too many people waiting. No, you, it was it was on a you were on a conveyor belt. You just moved past at this kind of speed, and that and that was all you could do. Um, but uh, but as I say, I remember Tom B, Tom Baker being, but he was great. You have to remember as well. This was with Tom Baker. He'd not long left the show, and he was very very actively trying to distance himself from the show purely for for, for work reasons. You know, that's that that's what it comes down to. So you can't really blame well, him for. Little, and there's a, little. a difference between trying to distance no. yourself from the show itself and the fan base and the audience. Yeah, he wasn't trying to do that. Um, no. And also, I think the fact that he was there was down to J&T. You know, again, I think because even though he and J John hadn't necessarily got on particularly well when John took over, 
they had they they had actually got on very well socially um and it was john that i think persuaded him to come along i think he was yes he was trying to distance himself because i think it was a hard decision to make yes you know i think after that long you know and he yes. knew he, he knew he needed to get out um uh i do remember actually um interview I, my the very first person i ever interviewed with a with the friend of mine john heckford was when the, the previous december when he was touring with the royal shakespeare company with educating rita um and we'd managed we, we managed to arrange an interview with him before the show on the friday night at pool um and he and the when we were waiting the stage manager or whatever had said oh you know tom's gonna go back and be doing doctor who again and we sort of looked at each other and we thought what um and so we asked him about this and he said well j and t had come down to see him when the show was in brighton the week before and that was when they'd gone out after the show and obviously gone to the pub or whatever and john was trying <laughs> to persuade him to do the five doctors oh um you know he tried to persuade him but in the end you know tom just thought it's too soon you know and um and i don't think he was that impressed with that version or whatever version of the script he'd been shown. I don't think the script had even been finished at that point, you know, and it's, but, but, um, but, but, but I do, it, I do remember that. <laughs> but it's, but it's funny because when you, when you see Tom, when he was in here, when he was in the role, any his heyday when he was in some of those publicity photos that you see when he was opening Blackpool or he was at, at any event where he is literally in command and he's taking the stage yeah. and he's ebullient in, 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 in excess and yet at long leads he was very subdued in comparison you saw quite a quite a, a much yes the, the, i think the simple way to explain it is he was very much like he was in season 18 as opposed to how he was in say season 14 <laughs> or 15. when well, he that's, wasn't the star it. anymore was he you know no. peter davison was the star you know yes. so i, I think and he was probably and aware of that as well and, you know and, and it's interesting because I, again i mean i don't know about you phil but i i'm looking down my list at the moment that the davison years forum was at four o'clock on the sunday that was the last panel of the day and i was certainly there and there was a real frisson of excitement seeing uh, as the whole as the current team came out and sat there so you not only got peter davison in costume you've got janet field and you've got sarah sutton you've got anthony ainley and so to get that whole team out and valentine dial and valentine, valentine dial. dial yeah you're right I was and so too. Yeah, so to get that whole oh current team out in front of your eyes in one go, and there was a real frisson. That, 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 that and the season 20 had only ended a few weeks ago, hadn't it, on the TV? Literally a couple of weeks. Literally yeah, couple literally. Weeks yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. The King's Demons were still fresh in our minds, and we still got the Five Doctors <laughs> to look forward to. Yeah, you know, yeah, this is the thing. Yeah. By then, we knew the Five Doctors was coming. So, so as I say, you can't... You can't uh, underestimate the buzz in Longleat on that day. So talking there about the fan experience that we and haven't the mentioned yet. Go on. Sorry, Dan. I was going to say talking about the fan experience and the buzz. What I was wondering about was, you know, you you were there with your parents, Simon, for this long weekend. You know, and and, and Phil, you know, you were there with your tent in the in the mud but how <laughs> how did you find relating to the other fans was there a sense of camaraderie there did you make it did you meet people there that you already knew either in in day-to-day -day oh, life yeah. or as often pen pals or whatever or did you make any friends at the event was was there much of a fellow feeling there that transmitted amongst the the fans uh, i i certainly i certainly went up with with some local friends you know fan friends that i'd made over that last year um and we met up we didn't all go up together but there were yeah. three four five people i think and then maybe i probably saw other people that i I'd, I'd met you know at the first the, the panoptican the previous year um and but because you know time was precious if you like you know and because of the cues you know you ended up being quite focused and deciding yes. well i'm going to go here now and then oh no it's too big a queue right let's go there and so it wasn't that easy to plan i mean um i think it's great that you were in that forum tent the whole weekend well, <laughs> I, certainly got the entire I, I sort Sunday. of di i sort of dipped in and around um, I, 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 
I don't know why. I don't know. I, I, there was no great plan in my mind that I could see no. the cute crowd. So I thought, no, no, I just, because I was so obsessed with seeing my heroes, I just stayed in that tent. Yeah. And, and, and but Phil's right. It very much, you had to kind of stay focused. Certainly on the, on the second day, I remember staying quite focused as to trying to get round places and know that's busy. So I'll go here. But I do remember on the very first day while I was queuing to get into the forum tent for the first time and getting my place, I, I just, got chatting to the to the girl in front of me and i don't know where she's now i can't even remember her name uh, she shared her i remember her sharing her um chicken sandwiches with me this is when i was not vegetarian <laughs> and i remember her sharing a chicken sandwich and so we spent the entire weekends together then i can't even my memory is terrible can't, if you're watching if you're out there please if something like laura or rachel or something please tell me because I, I, I this was in the days before the internet you didn't you, i'd have just hooked up with facebook oh. Oh, yeah. I lost, lost contact with it. And for the people watching the video version of this, you can now see Simon Hall back <laughs> in '83 without the chicken sandwiches. Maybe he was wiped, he'd wiped a little bit from the corners of his mouth before this <laughs> wonderful picture in, in the doors of the TARDIS herself That's, here, Simon well, Horton with badges on. Yeah, absolutely, with badges on. Of course, Doctor Who badges. I'm look, that, that's my that's my doctorish look. That's me trying to be doctorish with my little hack, my little tweed jacket on. And yeah. what's interesting about that photo is that photo is actually taken on the Saturday. So this is when I'm walking around completely on my own. There is not a soul around. They're just busy setting the event up, uh, and this is the day before. So they've already set. Let's let's remember. This is the TARDIS. It's the screen used TARDIS. And it's, it's just the Logopolis hot. TARDIS. It's yeah. the, on black and black orchid. I think it was used in as well because Correct. it's got the different signage uh, and the bl and the black uh, the black base. Um, yeah. And and this is just plonked. Let's not forget. This is plonked in the middle of the in the middle of the um, the tennis court. tennis court. <laughs> and so that photo that you're now looking at, that is the official photo that I had done, the official Polaroid that was taken for probably a pound that they did uh, on the day, on the yeah. Sunday. That was Sorry, on the Monday. That was taken on the Monday um, with the drooping Davros, who was, who was uh, <laughs> worse. Well, rather there. even more droopy mandrel. If you, if you... <laughs> Very droopy mandrel. <laughs> but as I say, the fact that I managed on the Saturday, just wandering around, the screen used targets were sitting there. Nobody was around. It wasn't guarded. I could have just walked off with it if I'd wanted to. It's just sitting there. So I just got my parents to take a photo of me standing. In... So I, for a while, I actually got to go into the TARDIS and just... And just kick around on my own in the TARDIS. <laughs> it's, it's in there. It's ah. usually. That would now you, definitely be behind a rope or, or uh, something like that. Makes yeah. your brain oh, yeah. about it. But I got into the TARDIS. Nobody else. Um, and, and, and so that was, so, for, so if, if anything, for me, that was, the Saturday was the most exciting of all of the days because I saw it being set up. Um, you know, that, so there's this anticipation of, of what was to come. You know, you can't, get your head round how exciting this was and as it yeah. rolled as it rolled on obviously two days is a long time when particularly for some of the younger people who would have been there but it was it was steadily more of the same so there was more panels going into the monday more sort of workshops and uh exhibits with you know things with the effects team like we're talking yeah. about the production designers yeah well, and the radiophonics the, the, there's one thing we haven't mentioned sorry i must get i must get in is the auction tent Woo the auction tent the okay. auction tent. Okay, so what were they walking? What were they auctioning off, Phil? Everything. Well, they were auctioning. I don't know whether Simon's got the list. I have got the list somewhere. Um, no, I've got it but somewhere. I have They were selling. They were selling off a huge amount of, you know, Pages. what would be considered now holy grail items. You know, um, of costumes from Doctor Who and and Blake. Of Seven. screen used, screen oh, used. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Props and okay. models and costumes. The there, there was there was the fly from the Green Death that went. Yeah, they, the fly from the Green Death. Um, I, I've got a, there's there's one particular moment. There's one particular moment I've got to talk. I've got I've got to mention because there was John because they would also get the guests in to help sell some of the items. Uh, and I would pop in. I didn't have enough money to buy anything there. You know, I sh I wish I had. But, you know, I was just I was just a, <laughs> you know, a, low, a lowly chill assistant in a supermarket. So there was no way I could afford to buy anything there. But um, but I went in there and Ian Levine was obviously, you know, was was looking after things. He was like the auctioneer along with somebody else. Um, oh, he was the man with the hammer, I, was he? 
Yeah, I think he was. Yeah, the gavel. Yeah, yeah. The gavel um, that's the word. The gavel. The gavel. That's right. Um, and and they had racks and racks of costumes and things like that. Anyway, I, at one particular moment, I went in there and John Pertwee was there, and they were auctioning off a tomb Cyberman suit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. so they had several. I think they had two or three of those. Long. Sorry. That would have been sixteen years old at that point. Uh, quite. A, yes, that's right. Yeah, it was yeah. A, a moon base. It's a moon base tomb Cyberman suit. Um, and the next lot coming up was a was a moon base tomb Cyberman helmet. Yeah. Um, they also auctioned off the Cyber Controllers head as well at that event as well. I think. Um, but anyway, so they auctioned this, and I think it went for something like about one hundred and fifty quid. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is nothing when you think about it now in today's money that, you know, but even so, I think it went for 150 quid. And the guy went up to, you know, to, to, to collect him. And John Pertwee, here we go. You know, here you are. Here's your suit. And he reached over and gave him the helmet as well. <laughs> uh, and wow. Ian Levine got into a, said, no, 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 no. He was only bidding on the set. And Pertwee said, you can't give yes, the chap a suit without this. the head. <laughs> <laughs> and so Got this lucky guy went away with a complete tomb outfit for 150 quid <laughs> with the controller with this yeah it just and i can i remember the the the, the, the highest cool. lot was the um was tom baker's coat from season that's right the brown yeah eight, the brown coat eight, yeah. 800 pounds that went for 800 pounds which was a heck of a lot of money then yeah I, I, to remember America, that I think i think it was an american who bought it, it. was yeah. an american fan and I, I remember things like you know there was the toolbox from earth shock went um so many different props that, that it, it was literally heartbreaking to watch it was very exciting on the one hand it was exciting to stand yeah. there and watch people Boxes bidding because hard, because what, what what was amazing with this is that is that the bbc just simply nobody expected them to go for the prices and get the interest that it, that it was getting so we everybody was just standing there with jaws aghast as the prices were just going up up and yeah. up and up it was incredible to watch and was was this to raise money for anything in particular no, it was or was it just no i think it just went back or... into bbc enterprises yeah, BBC. i think no it's the bbc's coffers they just flop they just sold them off and, and and pocketed the money and that and as i say now although it was exciting it to watch at the time, time now in hindsight you look back and it is absolutely heartbreaking to see some of those the, the stuff that they sold off was literally it was mind yeah they were literally they were about also, three, four, but simon if, if they hadn't auctioned them off they might have ended up in a skip well that's so true at least they at least they went yeah. out there to to fat to fans who, who wanted them you're right <laughs> you, you are quite right but i think what's heartbreaking oh, is that you and i couldn't afford them phil that's what's no of course not no absolutely yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you couldn't afford to bid in the auction, but you enjoyed the spectacle of it. Simon, you've, you've still got your poster prints from 1983, from Longleat 83. Phil, have you got any mementos from the time too? Anything that you've clung on to all that time? Um, not to hand, I'm sure I might have. Hang on. If I rustled through this thing, I might find a badge. I don't know. Have you still got, have you still got your ticket, Phil? Yes, I've still got that. I haven't got it to hand, but I posted no, a picture I... the other day that yes, you can probably I, find got... on, on. Yeah, there we it's, go. Uh, this is one of, this is yeah, one of the tickets. I've got the red, I've got the red one. I've got. Yeah, I've got the red one, which which is for the weekend. For two days. That's and I'm but, the same. I've got the yeah, sort of plus orange. the plus the um the camp the camping sticker, um and everything e everything that they sent. Yeah. I've still got in the same envelope. I've still got the envelope. Yeah, um, yeah. With the big, and I have the logo there. With and I've got the program, and I've got. I did buy. I remember I bought a frisbee. <laughs> a Doctor Who frisbee. A, a Doctor Who yellow, a yellow Doctor Who uh, celebration frisbee. I think, which I sold a few years I, I back. Remember. <laughs> I, I remember. Um, but the other thing. But no, I, thing... I don't think I had an awful lot of money to buy stuff, no. so I, I I was limited in what I could buy. I certainly got yeah. the program somewhere um but i uh and they did have t-shirts i think they had some t-shirts and stuff but i think they were still quite pricey for my pocket um but yeah i think it's the memories isn't it it's it's, it's being the there and the memories 
rather than I the can, tangible items. I, I agree totally. And certainly, I mean, I can remember on the on the second day, on the Monday, because I spent the entire first day in the in the forum tent watching watching it. I see most of the interview panels I wanted to see. So I spent most of the Monday going around the various other tents. And yeah, there was the Radiophonic Workshop tent there. And I remember watching Brian Hodgson giving a really interesting talk about showing clips of, of, of um, enlightenment without the um, without the incidental music on. No, no. Uh, so he was, he was doing a proper workshop with a little video and they were playing these clips and showing them with and then he showed live on on a on a key a synthesizer as i recall actually making some music up um there was the makeup tent there was the props tents and and, and again you, the, to think about this it's mind-boggling now because you went into this props tent and there were literally the cyber guns from Earthshock just sitting on a table that you could pick up and hold and and uh, completely free no problem at all to just pick them up no problem at all there was zaphod beeblebrox's head sitting on a table again you could you know you could touch this stuff there was a, a relics there. relics from the golden age of british sci-fi tv yeah yeah <laughs> as i recall i think i feel am i right in thinking i think they might have had the exploded dalek from um from the five doctors in there i think they've got the the destroyed dalek with the with the mutant in mm. it spilling out in the props tent i'm sure they might have I, I i i'm i'm kind of i kind of think that was one tent that i never made must i never got into um and maybe i did i certainly went into the costume tent because yeah. they had lots of costumes around as well and they had some of madame two swords um Correct. wax works from the from yeah. the doctor experience that had been there the yeah. previous couple of years they certainly had tom baker's megloss yeah there. And again, um, and again, they were they were close enough to touch. I remember this that they were they were they were, yeah. big, and, and again because the crowds were so big, you kind of had to get this close to them. Um, you didn't really have much choice in the matter. So, so it, <laughs> I remember I remember poking um, Megalos. I remember I remember literally poking the Megalos. The, <laughs> the, the, the little I was intrigued about the little spines and to see whether whether they were sharp on Megalos. Um, so you could get that close to them. It was. Um, it's it, been quite it, intoxicating for a young a young fan who's seen these things. That's the perfect description, Dan. It was intoxicating. It was it was it was like an explosion in your head um, because it was something that you never, in a million years, as a Doctor Who fan, thought you would get to experience all of this in this concentrated head rush of two weekend two two days. It was it was like a trip. You were, it was like you were having a trip. Really, it was that it was that magic. <laughs> It, uh, you know it, it, i'm right aren't i phil it was it was whew, it was heady it was yeah it was it was it was special i think it wasn't probably until afterwards that you realized what it was because i think you know certainly i was sort of head down and just get to where i wanted to get to and enjoy what i was doing i wasn't really thinking too much about how great it was i suppose at the oh, time oh i wasn't you're right but no you're right yeah, it's only really? afterwards, and yet then when you look back, you know, and you just think, wow, you know, it was incredible that they managed to get it on in the first place. Yes. You know, um, and, you know, and within its, you know, yes, it was massively over attended, you know, um, they, they underestimated the appeal. And also on a bank holiday month, on a bank holiday weekend, where were people going to go? <laughs> you know, it was like, <laughs> It, it shouldn't have been a surprise, but it was a surprise because I think they, yeah, they, because they'd never done anything like that before on that scale. And of course, they were never ever likely to do anything again on that scale. What I, because what I what was happened. wondering about, what I was wondering about from your perspective, Phil, is to have been in all these tents and to see, you talk about the costumes and these workshops and production design. Of course, you now work yeah. in production design. You are an award-winning production designer. So do, do you think that anything – obviously obviously, you've been watching sci-fi at this point for a while. You know, did that – did seeing these workshops and that kind of thing up close, did that play its part in making you want to work in that field as, as, you, uh, um, as you made your way well, while, to, as young adults? It, it would be lovely to – whilst it would be lovely to say yes, it, it could have been <laughs> further from my head. <laughs> I mean, I was 18. Had to ask. Um, I think I think I was 18. That's all right. It must have gone in <laughs> there, Phil. It must have uh, gone in there. Maybe it did. But then I think Doctor Who and BBC oh. production and all of that, because Doctor Who was 
was the only show where you got behind the scenes books really and things like that like the making of doctor who and all of that yes. but that, that it was only through those kind of books i certainly remember getting the first poetry version of that book um you know and it was like a revelation about all what you know how they made it and i think all of that kind of stuff seeped in but i i never had any ambition or any thoughts that i would ever likely turn you know end up being a designer myself that came oh, much okay. later so, really so what? simon looking at you looking across to you though you're talking about about this intoxicating feeling this this two three four days because the build-up and the aftermath it's, it would have all have sort of built for you did this i'm i'm getting the idea now as we talk about this at length now for well over an hour did this all this doctor who all at once it clearly didn't sort of spend you. It, did it spur your fandom on oh. to want to go next level? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because I know because you. <laughs> it, this was, as I say, this was this literally the the, the, the long weekend was my awakening as a fan. There is no two ways about it. Because as I say, prior to that, I genuinely kind of felt because I hadn't discovered to us at that point. I genuinely felt like I was the only fan in the entire world. Um, there may be other people watched it and kind of enjoyed it, but I genuinely thought, no, I'm I'm the only fan. And so to turn up and find literally just thousands, literally thousands of people there. It definitely spurred me on because I didn't I didn't suddenly feel like, hold on, I'm the only fan here. Wait, wait. No, no, no. It was I suddenly felt a kinship with these people. I realized I wasn't alone. It kind of and justified it, it legitimized my love of Doctor Who. There's no two ways about it. Um, and so it was immediately after uh, going to Longleaf, immediately I joined Dwoss. Um, and then I went to, I'd gone to my first proper Dwoss convention by the end of 1983. So. So, so and it was not long after that that I then set up my own Dwos local group. Um, so absolutely, there is no doubt whatsoever that Longleat was the point at which I stopped being a viewer and became uh, an obsessed fan. That it absolutely spurred me on to the next level. And it also, it was also looking at all that production stuff again, because again, we've got to remember there was no, you, you hadn't seen this kind of stuff on television of the making props, putting putting um, uh, incidental music on top of an unfinished scene. You'd ne you got no concept of that. So to see all that, again, it fired my imagination from a television production point of view. And so I know that that did help spur me on to want to work in television. Uh, at that point it wasn't again it wasn't long after that that I first started writing to Pebble Mill saying I want to work in television um so literally the, 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 I can't emphasize enough that in fact there's me before Longlead and then there's me after Longlead if you know uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, that, it's that clear it's that clear. and the memories the, my memory is not as great these days but my memory of that Longlead weekend I, it's it's as clear as it was yesterday literally I, I, I can remember it in photographic memories like it was yesterday. It, it, it sparked that so much in my brain. Happy days. Uh, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, Indeed. I'm somebody who had read about it in Doctor Who Monthly. I had seen the, the adverts, and you could, as I said earlier on, that you could book tickets for this thing, but I didn't really know what I was looking at. But in the aftermath of it, when Doctor Who Monthly began printing pictures from this event... They were always in black and white as well. I think most of the magazine, if not all of the magazine, apart from the post in the middle, was pretty much in black and white then. They were quite grainy pictures, but I, I still wasn't quite sure what I was looking at. For me, as, as a like eight, nine-year-old kid growing up in the West Midlands who loved this TV show, it seemed the show itself seemed impossibly glamorous. You know, BBC Television Centre and all these people. And even though I could see these pictures of fans and kids yes yeah, sometimes as young as i was or younger with the doctor who actors in those in those tents i still couldn't quite believe what i was seeing and put it into some sort of context i still wasn't quite sure what the word convention meant but it did mean that from that point onwards those articles in doctor who monthly which i tended to sort of skip over to get to the comic strip or to get to the posters that i could pull out or the things that i recognized and understood it went from seeing articles about Longleat to seeing articles about, say, a convention in Chicago or various other even more glamorous, even more glamorous than Wiltshire locations all over the world. So it did it did awaken something for me, but it was obviously a much, much slower, 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 slower process. 
And yeah, it did amp me up for the five doctors where I, I wasn't really sure what to expect all those months later. But I think the five doctors, the, the night of the broadcast of that story completely changed my fandom experience. That's definitely a story for another time. But yeah, it's um, all, all that I've heard about it since in the three decades since it is the Doctor Who fans uh, Woodstock. So that, in, in my view, that we know there were a lot more people there than the BBC, than JNT, ever expected. And certainly the Longleat House could, could comfortably accommodate by the sounds of what happened to the grounds afterwards. But from it's one of those things where if all of the people who claim they're at Longleat 83 were actually there, then it would have been twice the number. So if you're out there fibbing about this, or maybe you've convinced yourself you were there, I don't know. Maybe we could all be, be there remotely. There are ways, of course, and some people out there did capture this event, didn't they, on film. Sounds like on audio as well. We can find some of that on YouTube. But if people wish to relive the Longleat experience more so, obviously you flashed up some DVDs earlier on, didn't you, Simon? Yeah. Would, would you advise them to start there? Absolutely. This, this is about as good as it gets. And, and let's be in no doubt at all that uh, the footage on these is not brilliant quality because it's all from VHS cameras. It's just all taken from VHS cameras. So don't expect, you know, HD quality or anything like that. It's ropey quality. Um, but that's because these the, the, all the stuff on here, the, 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 the event was never captured professionally. Um, it was only ever filmed by, by fans. Um, and so that's what these are. And as, as Phil says, they're available from, I think it's Time Travel TV. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, Time Travel TV, real, real time. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not expensive. They're about 10 quid, 15 quid, something like that each. Um, and, there's, and there's about three hours of stuff on here. So you get a heck of a lot of an idea of, of, of what was going on. These yeah. are as good as you will ever get to, 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 to reliving it. What, what you don't really get from these is the idea that we sort of talked about earlier that um, it covered the site covered a very large area um, and so uh, the, the, it was like a 10 minute walk from the forum for example over to where the um, inter the, the um, autographs were taking place uh, or, or or to the radiophonic workshop it, it was an outdoor it's a good job it wasn't torrential rain Phil's right it was cold but it wasn't raining thank goodness and it's a good job it wasn't because no. there was a heck of a <laughs> lot of walking between all of this stuff um, and it was all outdoors, effectively. You know, outdoors. everything was in Marquis. Yeah. You know, apart from the orangery where the autographs were, um, that's the only indoor element yeah. of it, and the Doctor exhibition itself. Yeah. You know, pretty much. And you can't help thinking there that was. Had it, had it, I think had it poured with rain, and I can't help thinking that it would have been a much more miserable sad affair because I think the water yeah. would have yeah. run through the marquees. They, as Phil says, they were only marquees. It would have run through the through the tent holes at the top and uh, the, the, uh, it yeah. would have been a nightmare. Because we're talking about marquees from 1983. We're not yeah. talking about deluxe marquees now. Yeah. Oh, it was cold. <laughs> there was, there was, there was another know. thing, though. There's another way. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, do you remember, Phil, that sitting in the forum tent watching the panels, it was really cold because it was just blowing yeah. wind through these through these open open um, door and flaps. through the gaps in the panels as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, they were tied up, but they weren't. <laughs> yes, they were. They weren't like sealed. There was no. There was no. You know, I'm sure Pertwee was glad he was in costume. <laughs> it sounds thing... like so many holidays that I had as a child, guys. There was camping for life, Phil. Put me off. There was. What was? Yeah. What, 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 oh, God, sorry, Phil. No, that's all right. Um, you were saying about where to see footage. The BBC did film some of it, and I think it's on one of the BBC DVDs. It might be on Maudrin or might be on the Five Doctors. Um, <sighs> but there right. is like a. I think it's like a a thirty minute like a film with John Leeson might... doing a doing a narration. You're um, right. Which show, yeah, which shows some of the layout and some of the of what of the event. It's like a promotional video You're um, correct. or film. But oh, there is something I can't that. remember how long it is. Maybe it's three quarters well, of an hour or something. I think it might only be about ten or fifteen minutes. Now but there is some. There is something which gives a little taster. Um, there right. is certainly something about it on on the D, uh, on the BBC DVD which isn't real time stuff. Um, yeah, you're right. 
I think and I suppose the other way anyway. to find out to, re- to experience it is by talking to all the fans as well, people who were there, and to sort of keep these stories moving along, keep them alive, and to and to yeah, just to talk to one another as is always. I think that's a, the great part of Doctor Who fandom is it, the fandom experience, the fact that we can all share this stuff and uh, share the energy and the excitement. I mean, it is, it's wonderful hearing you both talk about this because, yeah, I, I do. I really, really wish that I was there. I, I went to Longleat House much, much later after, you know, after Doctor Who had left the screen, after the famous fire as well that, that had uh, damaged or wiped out some of the exhibits there. And so being there, I remember walking along these gardens and some of the pictures that we've been looking at now and some of the some of the images that you see a lot concerning this event. So I, I remember clocking some of those landmarks. And so going back there 15 years later even, it still it, it felt spiritually like it was like it was Doctor Who consecrated ground. <laughs> I, I think in many ways it is. Longleat has always had. I think I personally think more so than Blackpool. I think it's just it's just been Doctor Who's kind of spiritual home in in many ways. It certainly has for me personally because of the fact that, as I say, we did Longleat every year um for, for for many many years. And so then, as you again going back after the event as I've done many times since, uh, I, I, I tread over the, 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 those old pathways, those old gravel pathways that we were walking along that, that weekend in 83. Um, and it takes me right back and going to the orangery and seeing, remembering the, just the enormous queues for the, for the, for the autographs, because that's where all the autographs were, were in the orangery. And I never got one. I queued for a while and then had to give yeah, up. Me uh, too. I didn't. Uh, queues were too long. I remember hanging around outside, getting some photos through the door where people came yeah, out. Yeah, did the same uh, thing. And I also remember Liz Sladen and Carol Ann Ford chucking away there because they hated the portraits on the photo cards they would had done for the event. And they'd thrown them in the water butt next to the conservatory, which was all which was completely full, obviously, with all the rainfall that had happened on the Saturday evening. And you could see these <laughs> manky old cards bobbing on the water in the top of this water butt outside. <laughs> and fans scrambling at them because they, they became really rare. They're really rare, yeah. rare those, those first two cards of Susan and, and, and Sarah. <laughs> yeah, because they were withdrawn. I remember well, at least, yeah, they were withdrawn. At least during all of this, you had decent pack lunches or you could get some food from uh, other attendees in your case, Simon. I've just yeah. remembered what those biscuits were. They were fig biscuits, everybody. Oh, fig, fig biscuits. Oh, those would make you go oh. to the toilet, yes. Fig rolls. Absolutely. Fig rolls. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a big favourite of the Hadley family. Sadly for me, it does explain It does explain a lot. It does explain why some of those car journeys were uh, problematic, I think is the point Interesting, word. yes. I bet, yeah. Putting that. Uh, Simon, Simon, you were holding up those DVDs earlier. That sort of segue into what I wanted to quickly talk to Phil about. Because, yeah, we mentioned earlier on you're a production designer. All those people out there who are wondering... What, where and how we can see some of your work. Tell us about your work with Real Time Studios in particular and where we've seen your production design. Yes, well, pretty much all of, pretty much all of my work is, has been theatre, so it isn't really readily available. Um, but yeah. um, a couple of years ago, I was very fortunate to, um, to be asked by Keith Barnfather, um, who uh, was working with Philip martin to do um a spin-off uh, featuring nabil shaban as sill um and yeah this 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 was the the end result <laughs> sill and, and the, the devil seeds of arador of arador yes it's available on blu-ray and dvd yeah. i understand isn't it blu-ray it's and dvd yes yes a wonderful achievement for for yourself for keith and nabil and the entire cast i think so sophie's in that one isn't she and lots of great people that's right uh, yeah uh, i got to design great... sophie aldridge's first alien costume who would ever have believed that that's a claim to <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, a it was a, really, it was a, it was a privilege well, we'd love it was, to it was a privilege in depth because i think this this sure. is a four-part story isn't it? so it's divided up into 25 minute chunks and it's really it ambitious is. i mean that wasn't yeah yeah that wasn't the, the original flavor, flavor idea you know oh, i'm sorry say again uh, it 
it, it, it's, it's got the flavour of it's got the flavour of classic Doctor Who, and I think it would be great to talk about it at some length. I've spoken to Keith a little bit about it in the past. Larry's a difficult man to, to nail down. He's a very very busy guy. Same with Nabil, but I, I'd love to speak to one or two or all of you about it. At well, some point. he's been over. It, he's been over great. in Cyprus. Keith, Keith has been over in Cyprus throughout Is really? pretty much all the lockdown. Um, so Is he really, I'm but I think he's back soon. Lot. Yeah, back. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Back, back to the grindstone, banging out. Yeah, because I've seen they're launching new projects all the time. Will you be working on further projects with them, or what have you got on to work work on since? Because obviously, Hopefully, close I to mean, uh, no, nothing. Uh, we're we're hoping to do um, the sequel to Sill and the Devil Seeds. Um, yeah. Well, I think the last thing Philip Martin wrote before his sad passing last year. Um, I think he he finished the script for for a sequel called vote sill i've certainly seen uh, that talked about on social media i think i think Keith yeah that's right that. uh we haven't really had any discussions about that yet uh like i say obviously because keith's been in cyprus um and with lockdown uh and everything until we can really start getting things back to some kind of normality but but that's yeah. certainly um something for the future yeah hopefully we're watching but people can order that can't they where, where can they order it directly from? yes it's available on amazon or um you can download you can stream it from time travel tv the website as well um but uh, and you can also buy the blu-ray and dvd from there too um mm. but you can also buy from amazon as well the, the blu-ray and dvd <laughs> so go on to time travel tv and pick up devil seeds of arador and pick up the long league videos at the same time Result. there'll be some links There'll be some links to all of that in the description of the video and in the show notes to the podcast, wherever you're you're listening to us on. That, that is the old girl. Yes, she's starting up and calling time on another fantastic intergalactic conversation here at Type 40. I'll be back with some more. Look out for that wherever you found this. It could have been on Apple Podcasts. You can search for the Fandom Podcast Network over on there. We're still on the Fandom Podcast Network's master feed. Of course we are, but you can find us separately on Apple Podcasts now with our own feed due to popular demand, as well as all those other podcatchers, the podcatcher of your choice. So I'm talking about Spotify. I'm talking about TuneIn, Google Play, all those other places. So if you just search for us, odds are you will find us. Simon. I understand the Hoonatics is all of a buzz at the moment. Lots of conversation. So where can people find you to, to engage some more? Absolutely. They can go and find us on Facebook, uh, where we've got the Facebook page there called Doctor Who, the Hoonatics. Uh, whether you're an old Hoonatic from way back in the late 80s, yes. like Phil was, uh, or whether you're a newbie, come on and uh, come and say hello on the Facebook page. You'll find me there as well. And where can people hear more from you across social media, Phil? Where can people connect with you? Uh, I'm on Twitter as Phil Newman Design, and that's D sign, so it's just a letter D, S I G N, um, at the end. Um, uh, a lot of cool kids do. Yeah. And yeah, and I'm on Facebook um, and Instagram as Cosmic Phil on Instagram. <laughs> Cosmic Phil. Cosmic Phil. So that's like one well, of the I was Avengers, the Cosmic Correspondent Cosmic. for CT, you see. Back oh, in the day, were, I, 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 ah. I was the cosmic correspondent. So, <laughs> about that. that was the that was the Doctor Who Appreciation Society's magazine celestial toy room, isn't it? It's the, there's some newsletter. newsletter. It was the newsletter. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That was that was in eighty seven, eighty eight ish. Yeah. That was around the time that I was reading. God, we could we could probably talk for hours and hours and hours. So this, that's my way around, of closing this. Hey, Phil, <laughs> you have to come back to the show now. You have to come back now. We've said nice I'd things about to. all that. Yeah, I, I, remember, <laughs> I remember CT back in the day. And yes, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram as the Spacebook, where I ramble on and post about whatever catches my my eye, my imagination, or both in popular culture, inside and outside of the TARDIS. There's links to all of that in the show notes. Yes, we uh, always have the time, if you have the space here, at Type 40. But, uh, yeah, wherever you are now, safe journey. Yeah, speak to you soon. Bye-bye.